All right, everybody. How's it going? Uh, hope you're well wherever you're at. You're pretty nice over here, I must say. Um, looking forward to this. We got a little bit of a. Uh, um, <clears throat> so I have an interview coming up right after this. So I'm really happy to just dive right into it. So come up in the um, in the chat with your questions, and uh, we can get into it, y'all. Um, we got a few things that I want to talk about. I got some Jordan Peterson for y'all. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I also want to talk a little bit about Abbott. Um, but again, uh, feel free to jump into the chat with questions. We always appreciate super chats here. That really helps us out a lot. And, um, yeah, we got some fun stuff coming up on Sunday. We're going to be talking about the, uh, the racial wage, um, and some of the theories behind that very similar to what we were talking about. Um, a little while ago with Marshall Steinbaum. I don't know if y'all remember that from early on in, in the Left Reckoning days. Um, so very much looking forward to sharing all that with y'all. But all right, um, I guess if there's no questions, we can jump right into this uh, this first bit. And Because I, I really want to talk about this. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Greg Abbott. And I got more stuff coming out. I know I keep on um, promoting it. I'm very close to finishing up this piece for Sublation Media. Um, but there's a lot of things that are happening here in Texas that I think are really important for people uh, to recognize, especially in the absence of any kind of federal policy uh, from the Democratic Party to protect just basic human rights at this point. Most notably, um, it, ha it has been that Abbott has consolidated power to an extreme degree. Most people might not be familiar with this, might not be familiar with the way that Texas runs. Um, but it's a state that traditionally has something that, you know, folks call like a weak governor system, a system where the governor is not sort of the end all be all like you get in other states. Um, the cabinet, for example, they don't have the ability to appoint a cabinet. So all, most of the state executive powers in Texas are set up by boards. Some of them are appointed. Some of them are elected. And the whole point of this was to disperse the power of the executive. So effectively, the governor would need to rely on their powers to convince people of things a little bit, um, you know, could veto things from time to time, but that right is even significantly limited compared to other states. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, basically it was a pressure position and most of the statewide power, at least on the, you know, state elected officials um, position was always held by the Lieutenant governor that starts to change uh, with Bush and it accelerates like crazy during um during Rick Perry's uh, time in office and Abbott inherits this and he inherits, you know, a couple decades now of GOP control of the state. Um, so many of the people who are in state government are much more loyal to people like him um, because there's no real threat or worry that, you know, Democrats can be coming into power anytime soon. But what's really notable is that since he, since the COVID-19 pandemic started, he followed the model of most other governors and mayors in the state and issued a state um, a, 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 de a disaster declaration, which gave him these kind of emergency powers that, um, you know, this was a very late addition to the governor's power to be able to declare a state of emergency. You know, and that was basically so that if there's a hurricane or a flood or something like that, they could move things quickly to get aid to people who needed it. Abbott uses this disaster declaration. Not really. I mean, in the early days, he followed the playbook that everyone else was doing, mandates, shutting down businesses and things like that. But eventually he starts to pivot to using that power to basically override all other um, local authority in the state uh, so that he can implement his very much, you know, anti-mandate uh, politics. And if it all ended there, it would be interesting enough, um, but it wouldn't be as big of a deal as what we're seeing now because Abbott has held this power for, you know, nearly what? No, over two years now, um, and is using it in pretty extreme and creative ways, most notably to be able to run his own border policy uh, in, in Texas. And he has extended the disaster declaration um, to the border, citing COVID-19 as a reason, saying that it's within his powers as governor um, to stop the spread of COVID-19. And it's the only real place um, where Abbott seems to be concerned about the spread um, of COVID-19 is at the border. And what has he been doing? He's mobilized a historic amount of uh, National Guard and, um, and state troopers uh, to the border. I talked about this on MR. He shut down trade with Mexico for about a week and a half. Absolutely devastating. Cost the state millions upon millions of dollars and the rest of the country. 
um, he negotiated these kind of, you know, symbolic agreements with the northern um, Mexican states over this. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on, um, particularly with these state troopers. So if y'all have you know, followed the show, you know, I've talked about what happened in the border with trade. I've talked about some of the other things with Abbott. And again, I have this big piece coming out on him soon. Um, but I, I want to talk about this um, border mobilization because it's one of these things that's been slow moving. And I think there are a lot of people who are covering it in, in Texas media, um, but it's not always a thing that sort of bubbles up uh, to the front pages um, for folks, especially outside of Texas. They've allocated something nearly like $4 billion um, to this <laughs> uh, to this mobilization. There are 6,500 troops, something in that um, range at the border on year long orders. And people need to remember, you know, these are national guards. This is the national guard. And yes, the governor does have the ability to mobilize the national guard, but remember what a national guard member is. These are people who are effectively, you know, part-time, um, they have day jobs, civilian jobs. Um, these are not professional soldiers in the full sense that like, you know, they live on base, all that kind of stuff. And what this means is that people have been uprooted from their communities. They've been uprooted from their jobs. And it has become extremely untenable, an extreme waste of money um, and deadly for mem- many of these National Guard members. There has been a rise, uh, you know, and talk about suicide, just giving people a warning here. Um, there's been a rise of, of suicides of National Guard members who have been stationed on these year long orders. Um, you have these horrifying interviews that have been done by Army Times where they were interviewing soldiers who have been sort of stationed here. Um, Here's a quote from one of them. I'm wasting time watching the grass grow at my observation point while my civilian job is dying on the vine. If my job still exists when I return, I will have a giant hole to dig out of. Financially, this has been extremely devastating. And then, as I was saying, too, you know, people are, you know, taking their own lives um, over this stress. And very recently, I'll pull this piece up right quick for y'all. Very recently, let's see if I can do this. Sorry for the delay. Here we go. Um, very recently, uh, a National Guard member uh, drowned trying to save migrants who were trying to cross over the Rio Grande. Um, and this has been a really, really clear moment of how dysfunctional and dangerous this border operation has been. So when they've been looking into this, um, there have been hearings over this death and they were interviewing command of this operation and asking, um, you know, are people um, issued flotation devices who are staying on, who are on the border, right? Remember Texas, I mean, that means frankly, the Rio Grande, right? So these are people who are stationed at water. Um, and they said, no. Is there a protocol for people who are on the river? And as of you know, last week, they said no. Um, so people are being stationed on the river. There's no protocol for how people should be, you know, interacting with that, right? Something that should be being done. And just uh, earlier, what was this? This is uh, from Tuesday. Um, It has now been announced that they are being ordered not to save people if they are seen drowning in the river, which is the most dehumanizing and nasty thing against every kind of fiber of our being as humans to see somebody suffering, to see somebody in danger, and to tell people who are, you know, the first responders, the people who are supposed to be trained for this kind of thing, to let folks drown. Absolutely monstrous. And on top of this, because this is a state order, because this is a state order, these uh, National Guard troops are being paid less than they would be if it was a if it was something that was ordered by the Biden administration. And they're not getting payouts like they would if, if they were to be killed in action, right? Like they would be if it was a federal order. So families are now, uh, you know, these people who like this, this young person who, who drowned trying to save people are having to file workplace comp <laughs> um, filings to be able to get some type of restitution for the loss of their family members um, in this. The same people, uh, these National Guards people who are called up by the the state government, right, who oftentimes might be standing next to or doing similar jobs to people who are called up by the federal government, um, they're also not getting access to the kind of health care that you get if you're called up for a federal mission. So people are getting paid less. They're not getting access to health care. 
um, they're being put into this untenable and very dangerous situation for nothing but symbolism for Governor Greg Abbott. Um, and um, if they pass away, they are not getting compensated. Their families are not getting compensated in the same way. I just think that this should be a much, much bigger scandal uh, than, than it has been. It shows a complete lack of respect uh, for those people. And it also certainly shows a lack of respect um, and dehumanization of migrants who are trying to cross over the border. The hard border policy in Texas has been an absolute disaster, a human disaster for a long time. And it's only gotten worse um, as Republicans continue to dig down deep on this untenable situation of ha having an extremely hard border, which only encourages the most dangerous kind of, of, of crossings um, for people. And it's, it's not only devastating in this way, um, but it's also devastating because there should be some kind of federal response. Greg Abbott right now, I don't know, I'm sure people have seen this, um, is saying that he's wanting to challenge is moving to challenge, uh, you know, Supreme Court precedent, and in the uh, after you know this kind of Roe v. Wade uh, decision was leaked um, to educate migrants in schools, something that has been policy in the United States government for a long, long time. He wants to challenge this and take people outside of our education system, um, people who are deeply meshed in their communities, people who have a right to be here, um, because he sees. And probably is making the right analysis that the Biden administration is absolutely weak. If you if you're seeing what they're doing with abortion right now, you see that there's no real backbone there to defend this basic human right. Um, on top of this, Greg Abbott is now trying to run a parallel foreign policy, border policy to the federal government. And we're getting crickets from the Biden administration. It's having massive consequences for migrants. It's having massive consequences for people in the National Guard. And it's having massive consequences for Texans. And where is the federal government here to stand up against this direct challenge to the federal government's authority to be the end all be all when it comes to border policy here? Crickets. Despite all of the controversy, despite all of the failure, $4 billion. And remember that a lot of this stuff has not been approved by the legislature. Which, again, if you're not like somebody who follows Texas politics, you might not realize how significant that is. That Abbott is almost unilaterally moving money, moving money in a really sloppy way. So it's hard to document. Private contractors are making millions upon millions of dollars here. It's a scandal that we're seeing play out in slow motion that's had deadly, deadly consequences. <sighs> and it's just absolutely absurd. And obviously, you all know me. I'm partisan. Not for the Democratic Party, but I have my beliefs. I'm not one of these people who was a neutral journalist or anything like that. But I think that you can make a neutral case here that this has been an absolute disaster. Um, and you should be seeing a hell of a lot more um, from the state Democratic Party here in Texas and certainly from the federal uh, from the federal government who's seeing their authority being challenged on a pretty exceptional way. But y'all... Uh, um, There'll be definitely more in that. I'd be curious. I'll, I'll go up in the chat, see if anyone had any question in there. Um, but I'd love to answer some questions. I have to roll out a little bit earlier today because we're doing an interview right after this. Um, but I would, uh, I'd would i be very happy to answer a couple questions. We have some Jordan Peterson stuff to get to. But as always, I really like hearing from you all during these as much as possible. So I'll scroll up to the top, see if I miss anything, and then I'll come back to the bottom. Um, a little preview. Uh, a little preview here from Rob Moss for our Peterson thing coming up. Any good God Jordan Peterson believes in would be too humorless to have made the world. <laughs> it's a good uh, theological argument there. Um, oh, man. We're also worried that we're going to have... Uh, Sean's mad at what I'm saying, professional soldiers. I just mean in the sense that they're not people who they have day jobs. Uh, they're not people who do this full time and that's not their only means of employment. That's the point. Um, let's see what's going on. Okay. 
Get this fight going on in the chat. Let's see. <sighs> I always find this to be a really annoying thing. How can someone be a, a neutral journalist? I mean, like, I, I think that, you know, there's, there's, there's a place for people who try to really focus on doing like hard news, like just the fact stuff. But I think it's absurd to act like you don't have an opinion. It's just like, it's like the height of stupidity to say, I study something for a living. I spend all my time enmeshed in certain details and I have no opinion whatsoever on it. Um, I think we'd be in a lot better position if people were a little bit more upfront with what they think about things. There are people who I have like political disagreements with who do good journalism that I'm happy to read. But this whole kind of secret thing, it's like, oh, these are my private opinions. If you're commenting on these things and you're, and you're, make, and you're making decisions about what you're saying and what you're not saying, I think that it's it's worthwhile to be able to juggle with the fact that this uh, you know this kind of perfect neutrality that Americans are so obsessed with in in journalism um, is is something that is frankly impossible. And I think we'd be in a lot better position when, when we sort of drop the veneer of neutrality on these things. <laughs> it's an interview for the show. Um, I don't have a job interview. I'm down. I'm. I'll go with you on them. Let's go, Grizzlies. I know you didn't, Sean. Um, just uh, trying to clear up any confusion there. All right. Let's see. Brandon says, I think an important part of objectivity is disclosing subjective bias, which is why a lot of people who disguise their opinions as facts and logic, Ben Shapiro, cough, cough, are a joke. Yeah, I mean, look, it's just just because you have an opinion on on like the idea that you shouldn't trust somebody who has an opinion on something. I've always found to just be absurd on its face, as I said earlier, like there's no way to study the world around you and not have an opinion one way or the other. I think having like the you know, an open mind or whatever saying, you know, my opinions can be changed by facts on the ground. That's fine. Um, and, you know, maybe leaning into that, that's good. But yeah, this whole thing that people are just gonna be completely neutral is just a myth. I mean, I mean, just look at like the neutral media in, in this country and see, I and mean, we did the whole thing with, uh, um, with Kurt um, Hackbarth about, uh, you know, the way New York Times, you know, neutral news um, articles supposedly are framing Omlo's decision to have a public vote about whether or not um, he should remain president, right? Oh, it's so sinister. He's trying to shore up support and gain power from a democratic vote, right? Um, and the way that they, they frame that is obviously extremely, extremely deeply biased. And it'd be better if they would just, you know, wear that patch. Jacqueline asks, is the interest in neutrality just something manufactured by the corporate media or does the public really believe in neutral journalism? I think that it's something that is sort of pushed, um, at least in the school system. I mean, I remember like just straight up, you know, doing things about sources when I was in high school um, about, well, we have to trust neutral sources instead of opinion sources. Um, I just think that like a much better way of you know pushing this is to get work on people's kind of ability um to be able to read pieces and to see where the writer might be coming from and sort of be asking questions well what's being left out here what's on the cutting room floor um is a much better use of our time than sort of propagating this myth that we're going to have like these kind of robotic unfeeling unthinking uh, robots just sort of reporting uh you know neutral facts to everybody um so I think it's I think it's definitely something that the the media plays on because they want to present themselves in a certain way. Um, but I think it's extremely harmful because if you really talk to any journalist, even people who do sort of consider themselves to be hard news folks, they have plenty of of the decision to run a story or not run a story. That's a political decision, right? That's saying this matters or this doesn't matter. This is important. This isn't important. And that's a decision that pulls upon your knowledge and your opinions and your understanding of the world around you. Um, you know, this, yeah, the, the kind of neutrality stuff, I think is just a complete myth. And I think, yeah, they use it to uh, try to bolster support to seem like, um, you know, they're not affected by the very human emotions that we all have. I'm a, I see them both y'all. Uh, so we're always happy to hear from our Twitch folks over here. Our friend uh, 
Kowalski's been on a John Brown kick. Thanks for the chat too. Uh, John Brown did nothing wrong. Changed my mind. Well, you won't be hearing much of protest from me on that. Um, yeah, and I'm much more worried about this kind of stuff than anything. Uh, Hash Rebel says free speech is so important during these troubled times. And what do they do? Ministry of Truth. Uh, it's intolerable. I mean, that stuff is absolutely frightening. Um, you're seeing corporations sort of line up lockstep with them. Bronco Marcia Teach had a really good piece in Jacobin uh, earlier this week about how PayPal is, you know, shutting down, uh, you know, payments to outlets that they find to be doing misinf uh, misinformation. I'm sorry, I'm a believer in democracy and I'm a believer in the people on these things. Those questions need to be brought to the public and not being made by um, one, private corporations or two, the government itself, because you can't take the position that the U.S. government is an arbiter of truth and freedom and peace in journalism when the United States government right now is trying to extradite Julian Assange for exposing American war crimes. You can't hold those two things in your head um, and say, oh, well, I think that this uh, new uh, anti-disinformation, uh, you know, <laughs> organization that the U.S. government is, is pursuing right now is going to be any kind of fair arbiter of this. You need to have those questions. Like Those kind of questions need to be public and, and decided by the public and not by people who deem themselves to be experts. Um, you know, like after, after uh, Trump got elected, I mean, it got really, really scary. I mean, outlets that I would write for, like Counterpunch, um, you know, were getting targeted by Facebook and other corporations to try to push down and tamp down uh, readership and, you know, awareness of what was being published out there all be, you know, in the name of, you know, combating disinformation. And what did that mean? It meant promoting, um, you know, organizations like New York Times, CNN, Washington Post, um, who at the same time, remember Washington Post put out those absolute losers um, and, and little weirdos at Proper Not, which was a completely fabricated organization that was saying that they had intel on who was being paid by Russians and who was a Russian disinformation agent. No credibility, no citation, no information as to where they were coming up with these lists. But the Washington Post put that out and listed names of people. Um, talk about credible journalism. I mean, that was an absolute disaster and an embarrassment across the board. And there was no reckoning for that. It was just a sprint um, to start trying to silence people. And you should be very worried um, in the context of the America that we live in, in the context of an, Amer of an America who has been spying on its own citizens, um, who's been committing war crimes in our lifetime um, that were exposed only because journalists were brave enough to take on, um, you know, this, this powerful state. Um, you know, th this game is, is very, very dangerous. And I think people who want to see, you know, journalists who they don't like punished and, you know, put into a corner, um, you know, for their own kind of personal satisfaction are playing a really, really dangerous game um, because the kind of things uh, that they catch and they pull um, have always been people who are anti-war. You know, Eugene Debs went to prison for opposing American involvement in World War I. You want to go back to that kind of game, that kind of society? Um, I, for one, do not. And I think people need to take that reality much, much more seriously than they do. Um, there's plenty of crap journalism out there. There's plenty of people who are purposefully putting out disinformation. But if you think that the government is going to be the arbiter and is going to be able to pick the truth from the falsehoods, the government who has every inclination to suppress stories and information um, you know, that are embarrassing or exposing things that they don't want the public to know, you think that they're in a good position to make those kind of decisions? You really, really have some soul searching to do, in my opinion. Jacqueline says, um, have you seen the weird claims on the internet that Trump supports AMLO and that Mexican American supporters of AMLO should support Trump? Um, well, uh, the second I'm not as familiar with, but we talked with, if you're curious about this, we did a whole thing with Kurt Hackbarth on this. And I mean, it, it, it just reeks of, um, you know, pretty extreme racism. Um, one, the comparison of Trump and AMLO, two people whose politics couldn't be more further apart. Truly, you know, AMLO is somebody who, um, you know, when he's doing things like trying to bring public goods under public, sorry, uh, natural resources under public control, somebody who I absolutely support. I don't necessarily consider AMLO to be, uh, you know, a socialist through and through. I think of him as a kind of like left populist um, figure who, you know, has some things that he wants to do that are good. He also wants to play a certain game that I wouldn't um, 
you know, want to see politicians who I'd be associating with, you know, socialist politics doing. Um, but the way that they try to act like he is akin to Trump, why? Because he, you know, talks plainly and he talks to people directly and he challenges the media, which has shown at every uh, you know step of the way since he's been president to be extremely du duplicitous. Um, I mean, it's an absolute joke. And, you know, there's, there's a really racial tinge there too, where it's like, oh, well, these, you know, these Latin American people, they just love strongman figures, right? Really, really nasty undertones there for sure. But I haven't seen the second bit, um, I must say. Um, I will promise you that Matt Leck does agree with this uh, position. Um, I'll just, that's all I'll say on that. But, um, spin me a sailcloth. Have you read uh, Empire of Cotton, a global history by Sven Beckert? Um, it's about the history of the industry and shows the origins of modern capitalism. Um, I haven't read the book. I'm familiar with it, though. Um, that could be a fun thing for us maybe to do. I know Matt and I are planning maybe sometime in the fall to do, you know, how we do our bonus episodes and we've been doing Marx readings and we also did like our radical tradition where we looked at like very important left figures. I think we want to do a kind of civil war American slavery month. Um, so that might be a good place or a, a good one to uh, jump into. Highly, uh, I, I definitely appreciate the suggestion there. Speaking of anti-disinformation campaigns, that sort of thing has been weaponized against even the most moderate left-wing media and organizations in recent years. Absolutely. I mean, look at the stuff that was going on uh, with us at TMBS, which was, you know, uh, had a bigger reach than Left Reckoning does currently. Um, we were constantly getting videos taken down, not just suppressed, but taken down because we were talking about Palestine, Palestinian liberation, right? That is the consequence of this kind of thing. Um, you know, nothing was being said that was like particularly radical or, you know, out to outside of, of the norm there. And like, that was too much of a threat for these systems, right? That's worrying. And you shouldn't want people, um, to be, you know, particularly private corporations to be in the position, uh, you know, where they're running, um, you know, the, the game there and making the deciding what rules, what is true and what isn't. Um, because I mean, remember when Facebook did this, y'all, they had like a fact checker and they had like the daily wire, <laughs> the daily wire, as one of their fact checking organizations on, on, on news pieces to decide if it was true or agreeable, right? Why are you going to give people like that power over information? Um, truly, truly frightening. No, the fact checking and Matt can speak more, um, clearly on this cause he actually, you know, was doing that for a while. I mean, the fact, <laughs> Information and politics are messy and there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot of things that are framed in a way that is untrue or is meant at least to confuse people. Um, and it's not about not wanting to deal with disinformation or challenging wrong information. It's about who is getting to make the final and only say on these kind of things. And I'm much more comfortable with letting those things come to the people rather than unelected um, groups uh, as as a. Uh, Zionic uh, historians saying here, I remember y'all what was going on with Bernie Sanders. I remember they were every like every week they were giving Bernie Sanders like four Pinocchios for completely asinine um, and stupid reasons saying that, you know, Bernie Sanders is lying to the American public um, about the about Medicare for all um, or, you know, wealth inequality in this country. I mean, really, really silly stuff. It's been a little while. I can't think of any like particular examples, but we did plenty of debunking of that on TMBS. Um, for y'all to find if you want to, um, you know, if you, if that's any kind of preview of what a, a kind of government system would look like, you know, we're in for a rough time. All right. We got no, some Matt truthers in here. Um, All right, let's see. All right, well, I'd be happy to take like, um,
I'm just trying to read through these. Salam. Um, Lonzetta says, I was able to move to Colorado, but my family still lives in Texas. Is fundraising to help families move out of fast states a viable option in the short term? I mean, it's your life. Um, I can't speak um, to any of that, but I've always thought that it's it's important, um, you know, to, I mean, I've moved around in my life, um, but like Texas is, is my home. That's where my family's at. That's where my grandparents are buried. Um, I have no interest in ever leaving. Um take the Paul ropes in line. It's like, you know, you're not going to be able to get rid of us yet. And there's far more people, um, in, in this state, um, who, who support kind of progressive, uh, policies that are sort of heard in government. I was tweeting out, um, about this, uh, um, poll that just came out recently. Um, that should only 15% of Texans support a full on abortion ban. Why is the, the Texas GOP, um, you know, operating on this is because they're very happy, to rule in a minoritarian fashion. And I think, you know, people fleeing and people not participating in politics um, is a perfect gift uh, for the abbots of, of this state and, and right wingers, uh, you know, cr in states across the country. I, I think it's it's worthwhile to, to stay and fight. Um, but again, you know, everyone's life is their own. And I won't tell you, you know, you have to spend, you know, the entirety of your life just because you were born somewhere um, there. But I, I do think that like, at least for me, um, I don't, I, I've never found exodious politics, uh, to be the way to build a successful movement. <laughs> uh, champagne, uh, humanist says three Pinocchios for calling Bezos an oligarch. Bezos doesn't even live in Russia. <laughs> it's about us as, uh, um, as serious as a lot of those were. Um, on a softer to topic, will we ever get to see some Griscom recipes or cooking tips posted? We could do something like that. I mean, we've we haven't hit it, but uh, we were hoping once we hit a thousand, Matt was going to come over and we we're going to do some cooking cooking videos, a thousand patrons. So, you know, if you want to see that, uh, help support the show and uh, get some more people to sign up so we can fly Matt down here and uh, we'll make some barbecue and I'll do some veggie stuff, some vegan stuff too. Um, I'd love to. I mean. Um, you know, that's the, that's the exit ramp plan for me from politics, though. I don't think I ever <laughs> going to be able to uh, jump out of this. Matt Leck isn't real, man. There we go. <laughs> uh, Joey says, uh, love the show. I'm from Austin. Well, it's good to meet you. And so the political conversations down here at social gatherings are life training. Yeah, no, like Austin's tough because like, you know, it's my hometown and I've been around it for a while. Like, you know, it's certainly progressive if you're comparing it to other cities, but it's always had this, the parts of it that are progressive have always had this kind of individualist bent. Um, I think that it's sort of unfortunate for trying to build like politics that can win. Right. Which is like, well, I got the positions, man. I know the system's corrupt um, and we need something a hell of a lot stronger um, than that. Um, and now with all of the rich people coming here, we're getting that kind of tech uh, multimillionaire liberalism, which is just pure trash. <laughs> Lanzetta, I mean, Colorado ain't a bad place to be, friend. Um, I, I love Colorado. All right. I mean, no, we appreciate Twitch uh, subs, certainly. I'm, I'm just trying to get him here in general, but 1,000 was a goal that we put out early on. Um, well, you know, also, you know, as always, for people, if you ever need a, a deal on the monthly membership, feel free to DM us and we can set something up. Uh, we want to make sure that people who have access to it. So, uh um, but I appreciate the sentiment, Tony. All right. Y'all want to do some Peterson um, before we roll, and then I'll come back and do some questions for the last 15 minutes. Because this, this these Peterson things are pretty fun. Um, just give me one second. I'll set this video up. I have two Peterson videos just because every time in TMBS fashion, every time we get a new Jordan Peterson crown video, uh, I think we're sort of contractually obligated to play it. Um, so let's play this one first and then we can go to, uh, and thanks Kowalski for the chat there too. Um, and then we can go, uh, 
to the second bit about God. Oh, shit, I should put my headphones in for this. And you think, well, I, you know, we're going to destroy the planet. We have to do this. We have to demoralize the youth to be ethical. It's like, yeah, really, that's your f theory. You're going to demoralize young people to be ethical. That's your theory. It's like, you should go home and think about that for like a year. And I'm passionate about this, you know, because you have no idea how many people that's killing. You have no idea. I see people everywhere, all over the world, they're so demoralized. Especially young people, especially young people with a conscience, because they've been told since they were little that there's nothing to them but corruption and power. It's like, how the hell do you expect them to react? You know, they... Well, I shouldn't do anything, man, you know? I get worried sometimes, because he is, he is not well. <laughs> um, the uh, the king of masculinity there. Um, <laughs> where to start? I mean, I will say if you watch that entire, that's from a interview he did with the Hoover Institute um, called "The Importance of Being Ethical" with Jordan Peterson. And I will say, and not to disappoint, because we're gonna we're gonna come at uh, Peterson in a second. You know what he's responding there to is actually something. I don't agree with Peterson because what he the way he frames these things is always, I think, very duplicitous. But he's actually talking about um, a professor that he knows, allegedly, um, who built a very nice greenhouse and is only had one child and is sort of lecturing and hectoring his students about consuming less um, and, and living a certain kind of lifestyle, a lifestyle that is only available to a kind of super rich people who can decouple. Um, from these kind of systems so that they feel more ethically pure. That is the kind of green movement um, politics that I've always found to be complete trash, right? That one, the individualist notion of these things. Um, and two, uh, you know, this kind of personal morality that plays into it. So I agree with Peterson, actually, um, that that's not a great way to motivate people. But Peterson is not making the argument that I'm making, uh, that we should be taking a social and collective struggle, right, which is climate change, and dealing with on a social and collective level um, instead of this kind of individual bourgeois trash politics that we see from so many liberals that has gotten us nowhere other than maybe a kind of booming uh, green industry to sort of placate the, the, the guilt and, and fears of the wealthy. Um, but Peterson isn't making that argument. Peterson here is making the argument that talking about the reality of warming planet, talking about the reality of failing systems, you know, they're talking about here, um, we're getting all the warnings in Texas. It's going to hit a hundred this weekend. Um, you know, turn down your AC, uh, don't consume because the grid can't handle it. Despite the fact, you know, that we had people die, uh, during the winter storm, uh, you know, a couple years back, um, They've done very, very little to make sure that this grid works, right? Um, we're already facing the reality of a warming planet. Um, more and more extreme switches and turns um, in, in, in the environment and in, uh, you know, in weather uh, that cause systems to fail. Um, fail not only because they're not updated, but failed in Texas in particular because there's such a nasty profit motive within that system that doesn't create a very rational or effective a way of providing power for people. Peterson is not making that argument. Peterson is saying that young people are shutting down, right? And he holds his, himself very closely as he says this. Um, the young people are shutting down because there's too much negativity out there and they're, they're being made to feel bad, um, which is, you know, the most ludicrous way. And, and I think one of the, the sillier ways to address something that is a real problem that he's reacting to. And that's the real Peterson trick. Um, I must say, I know on this side and most people watching this, none of us are big Peterson fans, but it is worthwhile to know why is Peterson popular? Because he speaks to real feelings um, and anxieties that people have, that the world's not working, that it's scary, and that they are being personally targeted for things, right? Because so much of American liberalism is this kind of scolding mentality, and it's not good. Um but instead of saying, okay, well, we need to change that kind of personal individualist mentality that so dominates uh, those politics into something that is collective and hopeful and actually aims to build a better future for people, Peterson wants to shut it down, put your, he your head in the sand, um, and, uh, and, and completely decouple yourself 
um, from public life. I mean, that's his argument, right? He says, don't, you can't criticize anyone else until you have your own house in order, which is the most cowardly way to interact and walk around the world, right? That until you become the perfect human being, right? It's an unattainable standard. Until you become the perfect human being, don't you ever talk about systems. Don't you ever talk about the society that, you, that you're living in. It's anti-democratic. It's cowardly. Um, and it's a weak-minded uh, morality that Peterson is pushing forward. Extremely nasty. But he speaks ethically in ethical moral language that is attractive to folks. And we should um, you know, take that um, with a grain of salt for sure because it's performance, right? But it's performance that has been effective um, to some extent. And we should never be outflanked by a kind of raving lunatic um, who can point to things that might make some people uncomfortable. Um, and then mix that obviously with a lot of horrible social conservatism, personal conservatism, patriarchal thinking, all that kind of stuff. Um, we should just be able to dominate somebody like that. And I think that there is a problem um, on the left of being able to talk um, in these kind of grand uh, ways to being able to talk on that kind of ethical, personal dimension that was really motivating and healing and powerful for folks. Um, because he only exists in our lack, if you get what I mean. Um, and he's also very funny uh, when he breaks down and cries like this. But I wanted to see, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the God stuff because I think this is um, Peterson at some of his most sinister and, and cynical is the way that he sort of puts forward, uh, you know, the God equation for people. You know, cards on the table, I'm not a believer, um, but I recognize where these things sort of play a role in people's lives. And the way that he comes up, uh, his justification of God and the God itself that he wants to convince people to believe in, um, I, I think is, uh, you know, a very unfortunate and dangerous one. But let's let, uh, you know, Dr. Peterson blow your mind uh, with some uh, facts and logic here. And all good things share some good in common. Well, what is the good that they share in common? Well, for all intents and purposes, that's God. And you might say, well, I don't believe in that. It's like, well, I don't know what you mean. You don't believe there's any such thing as good? You don't believe there's any such thing as ultimate good? I'm not trying to make some ontological claim about an old man living in the sky, although I think that's a lot more sophisticated concept than people generally realize. That's not my point. My point is you do have a belief system, whether you know it or not. It's a system of ethics. Whether you know it or not, there's either something at the bottom that unifies it, or it's not unified which means you're aimless and hopeless and depressed and anxious and confused because those are the only other options and maybe you don't know what that unifying belief is but that doesn't mean that it's not there it just means you don't know what it is okay <laughs> um i mean sorry y'all this is just like intro to philosophy arguments for god i mean this is the kind of thing i don't know if y'all seen that movie god's not dead the kind of uh, conflation of, for example, God with the good, um, which people have been making for a long time. And I'm not trying to step on anybody's uh, beliefs here, but I want to talk about specifically what he's arguing for here, why it's wrong, and also why it's appealing for folks. So let's start at the end, right? He identifies experiences that so many people feel in, um, you know, our society today, anxiety, loneliness, alienation. Right. Um, but why do we feel those things, according to Peterson? It's not because the social and the communal has been completely eradicated under, you know, it was challenged first under under early like primitive accumulation, the early growth of capitalism. And it was cemented uh, after decades and decades upon neoliberalism. I mean, read, you know, history about how, for example, social movements were, were started and where they sort of originated from in the 1800s and the early uh, 20th century and read about the rich social lives, despite the fact that people were working so much, despite the fact that people were facing so much, um, people had community, people had organizations that they were part of. And what we've seen through neoliberalism is the true victory, uh, the true victory of Margaret Thatcher's argument that there is no society, there are only individuals and their families. These are things, these are institutions, right, that Peterson um, makes, you know, holds the most dear, right? Individualism and the family as the social unit, 
uh, the beginning and the end of the social union. Those, the primacy of those two things at the expense of social organization, community organization, and I'm not just talking about political stuff. I'm talking about socializing uh, with people in, in your community. Those things have been under threat uh, through this system. People are alienated. People do feel alone. Um, and it's because of the, you know, the alienation that you have at work, right, where you're working, you're creating something under uh, conditions decided not by you, but by a floating authority figure, your boss, capitalism, the corporation in general. And then you return home um, to these kind of asocial um anti-communal organizations that have only propped up as societies become more and more alienated. I mean, American society, the growth of, of the suburbs have been played a huge role in this. Um, so yeah, people do feel alienated, but it's not because they don't have God. It's because the actual material social conditions that have come into power because of the kind of conservatism um, and pro-capitalist mentality that Jordan Peterson puts up have dominated for so long. They have deconstructed uh, the social to such an extreme extent. I mean, think about this. Where could you go right now and socialize and spend time with people um, without having to spend money where it's not a consumer relationship to something like that? Maybe a park, if you're lucky enough, a library, if it's not too underfunded, those are also social organizations right? Communal organizations, those are good. Those are under threat constantly, right? There's been a big push to get rid of those things. Um, the, the social space has been commodified and it has enclosed upon itself and it has become, you know, a, a consumerist relationship versus, you know, public space, public socializing space. All of these things have been under threat and only play into the general alienation uh, that, that we feel, Right. So this is this is the Peterson trick here. He speaks to an alienation and an anxiety that a lot of people have. Um, and then he puts in the most kind of conservative old world view as to why people feel this kind of alienation. It's not based upon anything than a hunch uh, that he has. Um, while, you know, the Marxist socialist tradition actually looks at actually existing society, actually existing history, and has some pretty convincing arguments as to why these feelings are so dominant uh, under the conditions that we're living in. The second bit, sorry, the, the, so that's the last argument that he makes. But the first argument that he makes in that clip is that God is the good. And without God, there is no good. Right, that's the second underset, uh, unsaid part of that uh, of that argument. This is the height of alienation. Where if you are saying that you believe that there's good in the world, well, what are you talking about? You're talking about the actual experience, good that you have experienced for, from other human beings, something that we have created for our own betterment. Right, the care of a neighbor, the care of a coworker, the love of a mother. Right, that is created by human beings. It's actually something real, tangible that we know. And what the abstraction that Peterson does is he takes something away from us, something that we're doing, and he makes it seem as if it's coming from outside of material reality, outside of social reality, outside of human um, you know, construction. And that's a really, really sinister, cynical argument. We're not getting into the metaphysics of, of God or anything here. The argument that he's making alienates us from our own self and from the goodness that we create for ourselves and for others. That's really demobilizing. We first played that clip of Peterson crying because some rich guy told some people not to have kids. <laughs> um, you want to talk about something that's demoralizing, take away all the good that we do for one another and say, unless it is attached to a personal belief in this kind of higher power that Peterson is laying out for you, it's not real. It's non-existent. Right. It, it's it's its existence is predicated on believing a thesis that he's putting forward. That is an extremely alienating thing uh, to believe because you're alienating yourself from yourself. You're alienating yourself from other human beings and you're replacing that with a kind of mental construction for what that human force is. Again, um, <laughs> the arguments he makes are very sloppy, but the weight with what she makes them and the things that he points to you know, do exist sort of intuitively for people. 
And I'm sorry, this is a this is a failure um, on our part to not be out there and being able to counter uh, these these points. And a lot of the reason for that is that you know the left is pushed down. We don't have we're not getting invited to the Hoover Institute. Um, you know, maybe somebody like Cornel West, uh, they'll give him some time. You know, every once in a while, but he's sort of treated as a weird eccentric. Uh, while you know, Peterson gets bated breath as he's just sort of rattles off old, old school C.S. Lewis um, kind of aphorism, aphorisms um, about, you know, Christianity and, and God and, and the family. Um, but know that, like, we need to get a hell of a lot better at, at, at speaking to the very real alienation that people have. And if I'm to make any, like, criticism in general of, of where we're at, like, you know, there's a kind of ironic detachment that a lot of people on the left fall into. And I understand why. And I'm not trying to criticize anyone's like personality, um, but it is extremely dominant, uh, you know, a kind of nihilism and a pessimism. And we have to remind ourselves that, you know, the criticism, the criticism that comes with, you know, a Marxist or a socialist critique of society um, is not for the criticism to be the end all be all, but it's supposed to start laying out a roadmap for a better world, despite all of the shit uh, that we're experiencing. That's powerful. And that's optimistic and that's hopeful. And uh, we should be leaning into that optimism a little bit more. Um, but awesome. I uh, I have to, um, well, let's see. Matt might be texting me. Um, okay. <laughs> um, I got to run in just a second. Uh, but I'd be happy to take maybe one or two uh more chats before I roll. How about that? I hope that made sense. I just like Peterson has always been a, a weird character uh, for us. I mean, Michael and I would spend a lot of time talking about this actually, and we always intended to build a larger project around. It. And I think it showed in the work, uh, but that's one of those things as there were many things that unfortunately um, were, were left, were left undone. I'm sorry. I'm definitely because a lot of people were chatting. I'm definitely going to miss things that were up. But if anyone you know is commenting now, I can uh, respond to a couple of them. <laughs> uh, Alan says I have three lads. Two of them went down the Peterson rabbit hole. Luckily, both came out relatively quickly. One is now a communist, and the other is left leaning, but with a very tidy room. Hey, I mean, cleaning your room is a good thing. Um, taking care of yourself, I think is a very good thing. And, uh, we shouldn't run away from that kind of stuff either. Um, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, look, I was a, I was a conservative when I was younger too. We all come out, <laughs> um, spin me a sailcloth says, have you read masculine domination by Pierre Bourdieu? Um, it's a great read about how subtle and pervasive the masculine structure uh, dictates our reality. You know, I'm not familiar with that text. Um, but I will, uh, make a note, um, I always appreciate hearing all his book recommendations. And if I could make a um, book recommendation for folks, I'm waiting for my copy. Um, but I trust this person's work immensely. Um, Matt Huber, we've interviewed him on the show. I hope to get him on the show very soon. Um, has a great new book um, that's out. Let me get the title, pull up on Versta for you all. That I just, if I were to make a book suggestion for folks, um, if I were to make a suggestion for folks, I just uh, snagged my copy today. Um, it would be this book suggestion here. Climate Change is Class War, uh, Building Socialism on a Warming Planet, uh, Matthew T. Huber. Um, if you're familiar with Matt's work, if you're not familiar with Matt's work, I highly suggest diving in. You can find articles on Jacobin. You can also find things in Catalyst. He's written a few really great books, including some great stuff on oil and the history of oil. Um, but... Uh, this book I'm really excited to read um, because I, I think that he has one of the clearest arguments uh, for what the left needs to be doing uh, to build a climate change politics that can win uh, that doesn't fall into these kind of typical NGO or liberal pessimism uh, personalized uh, traps. So very much looking forward to reading that. I think you put this well, Sean. Sean says, while the poor and working class have been catching hell for decades, People like Peterson, rather than defend social movements, have made a fortune individualizing what are social problems. Inexcusable. Totally. And I mean, that's why he's such a, a criminal figure, in my opinion. 
um, because you can, I can just, you can see, especially if you're not exposed to a lot of other things, how Peterson could seem like he's speaking to the truth because he speaks to feelings that people have, but he ties it to this really nasty social conservatism. And maybe it's because of his figure, the way that he talks or whatever, that people don't associate those things. Um, but I think it is very, uh, um, incredible. Any response to the Madison Cawthorn news? I mean, we talked about it on the show last night. I think it's a, uh, I think these things are being leaked for a reason. For sure. Alon Zeta says, I used to listen to Alex Jones when I was a young dummy in Texas. Glad I wasn't too far gone. I mean, I remember him used to being on public TV here. <laughs> I remember watching him as a kid being like, what is this guy so mad about? Um, I mean, you know, a lot of people uh, wrapped up. I mean, Richard Linklater put him in his uh, his movie, The Waking Life, right? Um, that was something else. The Lone Cosmonaut says, I was in, into Ayn Rand when I was in high school. Luckily, I found Marx around the same time, both atheists. You know, Ayn Rand, I mean, there is something, uh, I don't mean this just in the same way, like I was attracted, like, you know, I grew up like poor working class, um, but I always like, I always believed in like the idea of, uh, you know, self working, you know, taking care of, of yourself and working hard and, and keeping your nose down and all that kind of thing. And to a certain extent, I still believe that those are decent values to have in the sense it's like, you know, it's, it is a good value to say, I'm going to work hard and I'm going to try to, you know, provide uh, for myself and, and my family and my community and to have like that kind of personal discipline. I don't think that those are actually bad values necessarily. Those are values that I would want to see um, in a future system, right? Because you want people who want to, to work hard, but you want to change um, the mentality that oftentimes goes with with that. And that, that mentality is anti-solidarity. It's anti-working class, right? Because you look at other people as like moochers and losers. Um, and, you know, it was only like actual reality of, of working and seeing, um, you know, being like, well, my family works way harder than all the rich people <laughs> that I, I'm walking in their big ass house and their parents always seem to be home. <laughs> um, you know, that those kind of small moments like really cemented and, and shifted things for me. And then it was when I first started working construction and uh, had some really inspiring and, and powerful moments of my fellow workers standing up uh, with me, um, you know, for, for fair pay and, and against abuse, something that I just didn't expect um, that really started to move me from not just moving from, you know, a kind of conservatism to liberalism, but going, skipping that step and going over to being a socialist. Um, yeah, I think that these traditions are great. Really respect the work of religious comrades like the Poor People's Campaign. I think that's the best of that tradition for sure. And there's a lot of argument um, for that kind of stuff um, and, you know, and reality there of, of how much that is much more of the tradition than this kind of hyper conservative nonsense that gets pushed forward out of folks. Um, I've talked to a few Peterson fans. They just seem to want to believe they can make their own life better, that the problems are not systemic. It's scary to face the st systemic realities for many. I think that's exactly, uh, I think that's on point. A hundred percent that it's a lot easier to internalize problems and say, well, you know what? I just need to work a little bit harder. I need to work on myself um, because that's, you know, might be a little bit personally daunting, um, but it's not as big as saying, well, we have to actually fundamentally shift the system. Um, I, I, I do think that he is able to operate very well because of that, that it's just much easier to compute something like that. Um. Let's see. <laughs> I didn't see his excuse, Strom, so I can't speak to it. Uh, um. Well, I've always liked, um, Clayton says, I've, uh, what you're saying goes along with my view that the left needs to co opt the rhetoric of individualism in productive ways. Cornell West calls it the flourishing of democratic individuality. Well, if you're not familiar with this, Oscar Wilde, who I will say is a bit of utopian socialist, has a really great um, piece called The Soul of Man Under Socialism. Um, 
it's a very fun literary text. I did it with our good friend Matt Leck um, over at a literary hangover a couple years back. You can find that episode uh, somewhere. And it, it is a personal favorite text of mine. Uh, Oscar Wilde actually makes the argument um, that only under socialism can true individualism actually exist in the sense that like only under a project where our material needs are met can the conditions needed to create um, and, and to prosper and to create and, and, and to perfect ourselves and to build ourselves up as individuals and to, you know, follow our talents and our skills. Um, you know, we'll need a system like socialism to be able to, to, to promise that as a society. And I've always liked that framing and argument too. I don't think that the left um, should be so allergic to things like personal greatness. And I think we should be able to celebrate um, great people and, and, and build community um, and, and a system that allows in people to flourish and pursue their greatness. Right. I mean, I, I think of somebody like Paul Robeson, who is, um, you know, was a force of nature, communist actor, lawyer, um, and political activist upon many, 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 many other things. Oh, football player, um, just unbelievable person with incredible human talent. Um, and he wasn't somebody who just sat on his hands. Um, he realized that he needed to fight for everybody else and stood up um, as a black man pre, you know, civil rights era in a very dangerous time at the height of, uh, you know, um, <laughs> at the height of McCarthyism and all of those kind of, um, you know, anti-socials, anti-communist movements. And I just have always sort of dreamed a social system would be able to produce a hell of a lot more of uh, Paul Robeson's. Um, than, than capitalism ever could. Um, yeah, I don't think we should shy away from, from greatness as uh, something to celebrate today and something that we want to be push, um, be, be fighting for in the future. Um, Jules says, uh, can people gift um, memberships to LF? I mean, do you mean Left Reckoning? You know, unfortunately, Patreon doesn't, as far as I know, allow us to do that. Uh, we do have a solidarity tier, right? Which is double, is $10. It's not much. And I think, you know, TMBS, we're charging eight for the show. Um, it, it's not much for the amount of content that you get. And that helps us subsidize because, as I was saying earlier, like if the $5 membership is too much for folks, always feel free to reach out and we can come up uh, with a deal for you all to find a way. Um, to make sure that you get access to that content, you know, a, a discount. Um, but those solidarity tier memberships help us sort of fund those too. Um, and that's probably the best way to to go about it, in my opinion. I wish we could do gift memberships, but it doesn't, uh, it, it, the system just doesn't let us do that. Um, all right. Um, I mean, if like, if it's a very specific thing and like, you really did want to set it up, we could maybe find a way, it might be a little complicated, but if you want to message me, um, we could maybe find a way for you to like buy a, you know, a yearly membership or something for somebody. And then we set it up under their email, but send me a message. We could talk about that more. Um, we're always happy to help old man river is, uh, I don't know if people are familiar with that, but it's one of Paul Robeson's like, it's the song and it's, a, you know, in the early days, uh, the early lyrics were extremely kind of almost minstrelly, uh, kind of thing. And, and he sang, it got really famous for singing it. And then later in his life, he changed the lyrics, um, from a kind of, you know, go with the flow, lazy guy, um, to somebody who is determined to fight um for for himself and, and and for his own class and like i think that artistic recreation of a song like that um is probably one of my most favorite pieces of things that like paul robeson did it's worth checking out there's a great documentary um i can't remember the name of it paul robeson something um but you can find it. it's very classic you know old timey news radio announcer uh that sort of breaks down paul robeson's life that i think is absolutely phenomenal um but hell yeah, y'all, uh, I got to run, um, but I appreciate everybody and uh, uh, I'll see y'all. Uh, we've got something coming up for, for y'all on Sunday for patrons. I'll see y'all next week for Griscom stream. And uh, we're going to be talking with Nick Bolin, 
Um, let me put this in the chat actually before we roll because it's worth reading in advance. Nick Bolin, um, who came on to talk about uh, why Democrats struggle in rural America and uh, that kind of uh, politics, very insightful and great writer. He's going to be joining us again um, to talk about this union campaign at the Starbucks in Denver. I'll put this in the chat for y'all. Um, in, in Denver, and he also breaks down the kind of uh, he, he breaks down the the labor history of Colorado um, in it as well, which I think is actually very interesting. Um, so I will uh, I'm looking forward to sharing that with y'all. I'll see everybody um, on Sunday if you're a patron, and everybody else. We'll see y'all next week.